This is a podcast with the co-founders of Jensen, Ben and Harry. If you haven't been under a rock, you've seen ChatGPT take over the world by storm. And a lot of that is powered by immense amount of compute and a lot of data. Today, we touched upon the founders and their thesis behind building Jensen and creating the machine learning compute protocol to power the world. I hope you enjoy. Today, I'm super excited to have on Ben and Harry, uh, the co-founders of Jensen. Uh, I think we all kind of with the prolification of ChatGPT3, ChatGPT4, we're all very interested in kind of AI and also the crypto adjacent AI world. And I am very excited for this conversation because I don't think there is anybody else better to have this conversation with than Ben and Harry. Um, before kind of diving into the specifics of Jensen, what you guys are both building, I would love for you to just do a brief background on yourself and how Jensen ultimately came about. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Logan. Thanks for having us on. I know it took a while for us to actually get this scheduled in. It was, uh, it was a tricky one, but really pleased to be here. Um, I guess very, very briefly in terms of background on me, um, originally from the machine learning space. Uh, so I started out my career, I guess, in uh, machine learning research, doing a PhD in deep learning when it was essentially exploding for computer vision. So after AlexNet came out and we realized that like convol convolutional neural networks were kind of incredibly powerful for uh, computer vision specifically. And then after that, there was this pro proliferation of different model architectures and things, and everyone was sort of exploring the space. That was when I started doing my research. Uh, and essentially what I realized was the design of those neural networks was being done by hand. It was kind of seen as novel research to hand design a new network, but actually that was just a big search problem. Uh, and so I focused my research on automating that search problem. So doing evolutionary algorithms for growing the structure of deep neural networks. Long story short, what I realized doing that is machine learning is incredibly computationally expensive. It just requires loads of, at the time, GPUs and, and still kind of predominantly GPUs. Uh, and as a relative poor PhD student, I had about four of them that I could run my research on. And the big players were doing similar models and similar kind of explorations with thousands of them. And they'd run these things for weeks at a time. Uh, and what stuck with me from that was the realization that I had everything else I needed to do these experiments. I knew how to do them. I had the data. I just didn't have the compute. And it stopped me doing these uh, explorations. I realized if I'm in that position, so are tons of other people in the world. Therefore, we're not moving as a species towards a kind of machine learning and AI future as fast as we could be. Uh, and I really didn't like that. Um, so that was kind of where I guess the seeds of Jensen started for me and like feeling the problem itself. Took a bit of a detour into uh, data sovereignty. I co-founded a different startup before Jensen, ran it for a couple of years. Very ideological. It was focused on individual data privacy, ownership of data, and how we kind of interact with the world. I think all of these things in the future will kind of come together. Um, but yeah, had a lot of learnings from that startup, mostly that people like privacy, but they don't really pay for privacy. So some good startup lessons there. Um, but when we wound down that startup, I joined an accelerator in London called Entrepreneur First, uh, and that's where I met Harry. Amazing. Yeah. And um, from my side, uh, my background academically is in econometrics. So as a combination of basically statistics and economics as applied to different spaces. Originally, it was in the kind of financial world. Laterally, it was in the political world. Um, but then after completing my postgrad, I was, or just on the eve of completing it, I was introduced to... Um, a kind of new new class of applied machine learning model in the lab that I was working in. And I basically, at, at that moment, just knew that it was what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. I thought there was something kind of like, a bit like Promethean about it, you know, like being shown this kind of tool which could make these, you know, far superior predictions to the current models that we were using, number one. And then number two, the idea that it was all, you know, it was... I, like I understood it, you know, for, for lack of a better word, it just it made it, it made it feel like it, like really powerful. So after the um, after the postgrad, went back to 
London, uh, where I led the data research team at an applied machine learning startup for about three years. And it was a narrow application of machine learning to uh, disasters and um, insurable risk. So the team were focused on basically applying uh, statistical machine learning models to building fires, wildfires, hurricane, modeling damage, you know, frequency, severity, et cetera, modeling with the built environment. So an enormous you know, data problem where insurers would typically, you know, model our buildings fire risk with like a handful of data points if it's like, you know, small, medium business. But we were able to add in, you know, hundreds more data points. And, and you know, some of them like relatively exotic data points as well, uh, which <laughs> which weren't used. And, you know, we, we tested very kind of bizarre data points as well. I remember at one point we were modeling things in Australia. And as a joke, we just took the UFO sightings over Australia and saw they correlated with any fire damage. <laughs> you know, that, that's a bit of a kind of like tongue in cheek one. But you, you know, you get the idea. There are lots of different um, things we use, lots of different models. And really, through my kind of few years there, it got to the point where I came to kind of two conclusions. You know, one, the compute that we are using is very expensive and in many ways a huge bottleneck when we're grid searching between lots of different models and hyperparameters to find find the most superior kind of kind of solution to one of these problems. But then secondly, that the data itself is generally like quite high value, particularly these kind of more like nuanced private high you know data sets with respect to the built environment and, and physical risk. Um, that was enough of a conviction for me to think, you know, it's a narrow application right now, but as, you know, we get access to more computer, if we could get access to more compute or, or, and or more data, we could really explode this, um, this space uh, and uh, take these kind of narrow predictions and make them much more general. And, you know, laterally that's been borne out with things like GPT, where it's a generalized large language model. Um, but back in 2020, in January, that was enough to make me quit my job. And I joined uh, Entrepreneur First where I met Ben and really we connected uh, on, on that idea immediately. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Entrepreneur First um, isn't exactly like Y Combinator. It's a bit different. So you arrive as a person um, having quit your job or quit your PhD with the idea of kind of pairing up with a co-founder on the program. Um, so some people describe it as like Love Island meets Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> or the bachelor meets shark tank so there's a bit of a kind of courting process with a flirting process that you have to kind of <laughs> go through to, to, to find your find your candidate ben and i met just before the program launched um, which was incidentally the week before uh, the uk uh, lockdown uh, for covid19 and um consequentially uh we spent almost the entirety of the early days of jensen virtual and that's con continued to today as we're a fully remote company um, we connected on three things to kind of conclude. The first was the idea that we wanted to build a very large um, kind of infrastructure for training machine learning models, which would either give access to more data or more compute. Laterally, we landed on compute as that was the, the kind of biggest problem that we, that we saw in the space. Secondly, we shared, although we didn't know it yet, a lot of the kind of principles which underpinned the kind of crypto movement. So we like bonded on like Edward Snowden's autobiography, which had been released like quite recently. But before that, we we shared many kind of like sci like cypherpunk ideals, um, although it hadn't quite made the transition into crypto for us yet. And further, and finally, we shared a sense of humor, which we've kind of said on multiple podcasts, but basically is the, uh, in, at least, you know, in our opinion, one of the absolute prerequisites, maybe one of the top set or second top prerequisite for finding a co-founder. Because if you can't laugh when, you know, your bank collapses during a Series A or something like that, you're uh, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> Definitely a very important quality uh, for going through the trenches with somebody. Uh, it's it's not easy being a founder. And I think to each kind of touch upon what each of you kind of clicked into was that compute is hard to get, especially kind of after this chat GPT moment that everybody has kind of more recently experienced where you have lots of amount of compute and a lot of data and kind of as you kind of ramp both of those things up you get more interesting results from these neural networks and so it's kind of been a arms race more recently to really get access to that compute with gpu selling for way over msrp value um people 
really trying to go to whatever lengths to get access to these GPUs. And so it's amazing that you two kind of foresaw this problem early on, had the foresight to integrate it with some of the crypto components that allows really these networks to scale and put it all together. It's super fascinating. And I think maybe to use that as a starting point, I think Jensen ultimately was described as the network for machine learning compute protocol, uh, bringing together really all the world's compute. Can you maybe use that as a starting point to go further into the vision of what Jensen is and how you guys are trying to accomplish that? Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe I can kind of say it from my perspective and then Harry um, can say from his, but I suppose to give like a very brief sort of history, like Jensen came about because we'd felt that compute problem. Like we knew it was a problem when we were doing the work um, and we could see that it was a problem that wasn't being solved by the current kind of progression of the market. Basically, the, the chip shortages were only getting worse and the requirement for access to those chips was increasing. And like if you, if you kind of picture the graphs of the two things, the lines are diverging. They're not getting closer to together. So um, one of the kind of really obvious things we can do as like humanity is make more chips, but that's a very difficult thing to do. The supply chains are very complicated. It takes a long time to build these things. Very few people can actually build them. Uh, so then you think, okay, if it's very hard for us to make new chips, what's the kind of next best thing to do? And that is just optimize our usage of the existing chips out in the world. Um, and then you kind of look at the market for essentially converting like a capex cost into an opex which is what all the kind of big cloud providers are doing they're like buying up these chips and then they're converting those chips into this this operating expense that somebody can do on demand uh, but when they do that they're able to charge absolutely enormous margins because the work that goes into doing that is quite complicated there's a lot of different aspects that you have to cover and those aspects are like weird costs where you have to set up infrastructure you have to build a lot of stuff but then there's a lot of people costs there's like administration there's customer service there's account management Managers, there's legal contracts, there's all of this stuff that just like gums the whole system up and allows these companies to essentially monopolize that area and then print a lot of money based on it. Um, and what we kind of saw was this opportunity to automate a lot of that process and in automating it drive down the costs that come from that and essentially take away those profit margins because it's automated you don't have those costs of starting uh, building something like this you can just kind of access it programmatically. So that was the sort of the light bulb I guess the light bulb moment was a little bit later, but it was that intuition that we can automate all of this process and we can make it a lot uh, smoother if we can distribute compute over all these kind of latent GPUs and the data centers that are already out there, et cetera. Uh, when we kind of dived into how do you do that? What is the process of automating this? That was when we discovered this sort of like crypto technology. And I'll, I'll touch on it now. We can talk about it in more depth if it's, if it's kind of of interest as we go on. But basically, we realized that you when you have a untrusted piece of compute, if you want to connect up everything in the world, you can't trust it all. You're going to have a GPU on your network that you've never interacted with. Somebody who wants to train a machine learning model is going to send something to that GPU uh, and they're not going to know if that person is going to do that job correctly. Um, you have to solve that problem if you want to make the network as large as it can possibly be. Um, and we realized that the way to solve that is through decentralization and, and crypto technologies. And that's crypto in the sense of cryptography, but also uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, and that was the light bulb moment for us when we realized, hey, there is now a solution to this that there wasn't before. Uh, and that's why at this point in time, um, you can solve this problem, you can reduce those costs, and you can make something absolutely massive. Um, and then from there, you can extrapolate out and I think maybe Harry can touch on this. But the vision beyond that of Jensen is when uh, these environments become automatable. So right now, it's loads of people interacting with compute. In the future, we don't think it'll be people. Um, but yeah, I'll let Harry kind of expand on that a bit more. And just briefly, Ben, that problem that you're kind of touching upon, is that the verification problem that is uniquely solved by the crypto aspect? Yeah, when I, when I refer to that kind of trust problem, that's it. You've got to be able to verify that this work done by a untrusted device somewhere in the world was actually done correctly. And that is, is verification of that compute. Um, and in the traditional world, that's done by trusting who you're interacting with. So you interact with AWS, you trust AWS. You have a legal contract with them. Um, if they, for some reason, don't do your task correctly, you have the courts and you have all these things that you could go through. But ultimately, you, you trust them because they're a big centralized entity. When you build a protocol, anyone can connect up a device you're just interacting with that person the protocol has no kind of 
centralized governance or, or people involved. It's literally just communication technology. Uh, what is your recourse to like getting recovering kind of assets and things if that work isn't done correctly? So that recourse to us has to be purely programmatic. It all has to happen automatically through essentially smart contracts. Um, and that's what the verification system is. Uh, and we think you can't build a network like this without that. You can build a small network, but to make this global and beyond, you have to solve the verification problem. Perfect. We'll double. We'll definitely double click on that. But before maybe passing it over to Harry. Yeah, I think there's kind of when it comes to the vision, there's kind of like two prior things to to think about first. Um, the first thing is the idea that you know there's been a few kind of industrial revolutions uh, over the, the the past few centuries. You could say that you know steam was one of the first following on from that you've got like electricity like the you know the electrical grid um and then thirdly and most recently the internet as the kind of main propellant that sat beneath a lot of the kind of advances for for the for those respective time periods and for um for our kind of generation now the the kind of big unlock is I, it is machine learning. It's AI, and the biggest kind of primitive underneath that is is access to compute. Because scaling laws dictate, you know, that the large, the more compute you typically throw at these models, the, basically the bigger you allow them to get, or the more data you allow them to train on, the they just keep getting better and better and better and better. Um, so it's clear it computes the kind of the kind of core core issue. And then the second thing you need to believe is that, you know, there will be a point in the kind of, you know, future where machine intelligence will reach a level whereby it is aut autonomous to the point that it can exist in society on its own merits in the sense that it could, it could create an API, which, you know, just the most basic example, let's say a machine thinks I want to make money. It scrapes some financial data, creates an API, stands up the API, provides the data, gets paid for it, and then uses that kind of money to retrain itself to make better decisions about how to add features to the API. Just, just something, assuming it's objective functions to get rich. We're getting pretty uh, sci-fi now. Yeah, <laughs> that would be a very interesting world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's imminent in, in our opinion. Um, so those are the two kind of priors. One that machine learning is like you know V un unlock for for the kind of next industrial revolution that we're just starting, and secondly that you know there's going to exist this kind of at least like autonomous systems. We can get into like artificial general intelligence and all these other kind of things, but bare, you know bare minimum autonomous systems which exist on their own volition. Um, our goal is to basically be the electrical grid for that world, to be the substrate on which all the advances are built. So if you have an autonomous system and it's a machine, you know, it doesn't have a passport, it doesn't have like a bank account, it doesn't have any of the stuff that we use in the kind of meat space to like, you know, interact with each other. All it has are kind of, you know, bits in silicone. And, you know, it exists in a world which is then perfectly kind of primed for using crypto as a means of payment and as a store of value, um, number one. Number two, you know, what right does it have to exist? You know, if someone else can kind of turn it on and off, you know, it's not really autonomous, but you can persist in the kind of crypto world. You can exist on chain. You can exist on the chain. And we think kind of as an extension of that, that we want to make compute kind of for machines as available as oxygen for humans. We want the compute, which is the kind of fuel for, you know, the, the kind of intelligence that, that is, you know, we're, we're building just now to be as available as oxygen is for us. And as a result, that's going to maximize the impact that machine learning can have. Um, so the goal, that, that's the kind of the, the long-term vision. We think that lots of models will exist in this kind of permissionless kind of open space. And through, you know, the kind of open availability of all those models, people will be able to train the models they want. And those models will be, you know, it, be reflective of their values. People talk about this idea of like, you know, we want to de-bias models, you know. Models are biased. Like there are parts in like models, like generative adversarial networks, which are literally called discriminators. Like their idea is to like you know make decisions based on inputs. That's all that a model does. You know any model. Um, people, 
in many other areas of their lives choose certain biases. They send their children to certain schools, which, you know, align with their values. They watch certain news channels, which give them the kind of, you know, the version of events that they want. You know, they read offers who they think are actually better than other offers. They consume art, which they think is better than, you know, other art. Like they make decisions with bias encoded everywhere. We think that people should be able to build their own models and that those models should be able to exist kind of in perpetuity and serve those people instead of having one kind of closed source, like, you know, Oracle, which is produced by someone in Silicon Valley that no one, no one gets at, you know, it only has one worldview. So there's a lot in there, but that's the kind of the broad tapestry of, of the vision. No, I, I absolutely love it. And I, I think the wording that really stuck was me with me was kind of the oxygen for general kind of AI. Uh, it's a very kind of powerful imagination uh, or like imagery. And you can definitely see a world that we're just now tapping into where we're on really a exponential scale of what we're going to be required for compute and training and inference. And we're really just touching upon that. And so by organizing that compute, <laughs> there's a lot of benefits to that. Maybe kind of sticking on this topic, and then I do want to get into some of the like real world physical limitations, whether that's like bandwidth, latency, like different compute clusters, or even the verification problem that we touched upon. What do you think, at least initially, when Jensen is kind of spun up, is going to be the main driving use cases for yeah. um, the network? Is it going to be purely on kind of more AI related with like the training of them, these models or inference. Um, do you think just by unlocking GPU compute, people will be able to do more generic computing, like rendering jobs, or is it kind of all the above just building the compute cluster to allow people to access that compute where before they didn't have that? So we're pretty um, opinionated in, in the way we think this should be done. So Jensen is designed to be machine learning, training, compute. That's the idea. Um, we've been we've seen quite a lot of attempts to do this for general purpose compute, where you can see the benefits that decentralization could have for general purpose compute. But when it comes to that verification problem that we mentioned before, it gets really, really hard to solve. I mean, it's a, it's a really hard problem to solve for any computation, but if you try and do it for a generic computation it's really difficult um essentially ethereum does that ethereum does this for ge general purpose computation it's quasi cheering complete but the size of computation that you can do is obviously heavily heavily bounded and lots of people have tried to sort of expand that out and typically when they expand that out um, they try and solve the verification problem and then they fall kind of back to something like a reputation system or like an ebay style feedback system some kind of like soft verification done via people as a way of saying we've solved this problem but when you do that those systems are very very gameable like just as ebay feedback used to be gamed and still is gamed um, you can sibyl it really easily you just give yourself feedback you do small transactions etc it's, it's very easy to kind of attack a system like that and it erodes the value of the system to the point where it doesn't have kind of use case value anymore. Um, so when we looked at that and um, when we were looking at solving the problem for machine learning, we realized that we strongly believe in the thin protocol hypothesis where very, very kind of narrow niche use cases are the way forward for building protocols. You do one thing and you do it really, really well, and somebody else will do another thing. And then the kind of space is built up by multiple protocols together, all solving these niche problems and being experts at each of those individual problems. So that's what we do. We only focus on machine learning training. Um, only focusing on training is a deliberate choice as well. Like if you think about the computations involved in um, the two main things that you do with machine learning, you're doing training, and then you're doing inference. Um, inference as a use case is ultimately, in our opinion, a latency game. So that's when you're sending your query to ChatGPT and you're getting your answer back. The end user in that case cares about how quickly they get their answer back. That's going to be the biggest kind of determining factor for them. If you look at decentralization as a technology, latency isn't necessarily the foremost thing that it kind of solves. Uh, ultimately, in the future, you could have a kind of decentralized like CDN style network that could get models really close to users and things. But that's not 
a problem to solve right now. It's a kind of problem for, for down the line. Training is, is very different. It's a massively asynchronous process where you need access to a core resource, which is quite expensive for a long period of time where you train a model for three days. You probably don't really care if it trains for another half day. Like it, it doesn't really make a difference to you, which is absolutely perfect for decentralization where you can ship that task off to any one of thousands, millions, billions of different devices in the world and have it be performed out there and just asynchronously return to you. So that's where we, we focus. And then in focusing so specifically on machine learning training from a use case perspective, we also have a much easier time solving the verification problem. We can do really specific tricks that you can only do with like matrix multiplications. You wouldn't be able to do it with other general purpose computations, but it's nice and efficient for our use case. And we've seen that in a similar space with like render network where they only do rendering, but they do it really kind of efficiently. And rendering has its own quirks that make it really nice and kind of easy to do. It's embarrassingly powerful. Parallel. It's really easy to shard up. It's easy to verify. Um, so they can have that part. We have machine learning training. Other people will have machine learning inference. Other people have storage, etc. We don't really want to expand out any further. It just doesn't make sense. Interesting. Yeah. I would add to that. You know, the the kind of the kind of to kind of riff on what Ben said. The two kind of benefits that the Jensen Network kind of confers to, to users are price and scale. So because you kind of, I guess, you know, disintermediate. The, the cloud oligopolist who sits in the middle and extracts a rent on the hardware by just going peer to peer, you remove margins which can touch 80%, you know, gross margin on some of this cloud compute. You know, it's not typically common that, you know, people are consuming a computer that has the kind of, you know, those margins. Like a lot of people like will, will strike deals and stuff, but, you know, it can be, it, it's eye wateringly expensive. Um, Similarly, because it's a global network of devices, you are basically limited to a singular provider, number one. But number two, you kind of expand the pie of available devices. So obviously, on the constraints of like a, you know, high latency environment where whereby you're, you know, you're training, you know, models that will comfortably take over a day to trade and you can deal with that latency suddenly different devices become available to you, you know, right down to things like M2 MacBooks. And this brings back in the kind of, to the kind of, you know, to view this idea of almost like mining Bitcoin on your laptop, you know, where you can actually now use devices in a way that previously weren't used to provide some economic value to the world and, and in a permissionless way and get a return for it. So those are the kind of two benefits. And we see those, kind of basically come, they kind of map onto different types of users, you know, from researchers at universities who don't have access to high performance uh, compute clusters and they, you know, they want to, they want to do certain trainings, but they can't afford it or they don't have access to it. You know, it could be a stipend issue. It could be an institution issue all the way to startups, which are building large models. And, you know, they're trying to compete in this arms race whereby, kind of the kingmakers like, you know, AWS might invest in a company or Microsoft might invest in a company and they provide, you know, this, this funding, which, you know, for a few smart researchers is essentially kind of, even with VC funding is kind of just, you know, insurmountable. It's just hard to, to beat but in a raw kind of, you know, firepower sense. But then we can come along and we can say, well, we can actually remove this huge margin that you would have been paying otherwise. And suddenly now, you know, you maybe get up to like 5x more compute, like bang for your buck. And as a consequence, there are, you know, $100 million of fundings now, essentially $500 million. And that allows them to fight with the heavyweights. Um, and there's a variety of other kind of use cases in there as well, including some crypto ones, um, whereby people want fully kind of transparent and decentralized training flows. We tend to focus a little bit more on the on the kind of web, web two, so to speak, use cases, purely because that's where the absolute lion's share of, of, of training is happening. And it's also the worlds that we come from as well. I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to add to that, that the kind of the crypto space I think has been through, it's obviously been through multiple waves and things, um, but it's had a reasonably consistent problem where everyone within the crypto space is very ideologically aligned with crypto. They want to kind of decentralize these things out. They want access to uh, perfectly like permissionless access to resources and things by people. Um, the problem is as a value proposition for a network, that ideology doesn't kind of capture the minds of everybody outside of crypto. It captures this small group who are really interested, but it can't expand out. Um, we believe in that ideology. We think it should be available to everyone. We view 
Hue Jensen is essentially like the open source equivalent of access to compute, where it can't be fully kind of open source because there's a base cost to compute that you have to pay. But if you can drive that base cost down to the absolute fair market value of the resource, then you get the equivalent of open source for that resource. But you can't just have that as a value proposition. The crucial thing for Jensen is the value prop, the two value propositions Harry mentioned are unlocked by decentralization and they're value propositions that it doesn't matter if you care about crypto. If you're in the web two world, you're a machine learning engineer and someone comes along and says, the compute that you're accessing is now a fifth of the cost, you're very interested in that. You don't need to know why it's a fifth of the cost. You just know, hey, this is so much better for me. Um, so I think Jensen's one of those use cases, and I think there are other ones. And I think the kind of next wave of crypto is going to be discovering these places where decentralization has a huge value proposition within the Web2 world, completely kind of functionally separate from the actual decentralization itself, but enabled by it, where we're going to capture out these like lots and lots of users. And then as a kind of downstream benefit, we get the decentralization out of it. And that's a, a really powerful yeah. thing. And I've been hearing I, that a lot more from builders, I would say more holistically. I think we're kind of going from the early adopters of crypto to kind of like the early innovators that will take us to the vast majority. And I think that it's really powering or using the crypto rails to unlock a new capability that was impossible instead of just being blockchain for the sake of blockchain. And that unique difference, I think, is truly the thing that's going to kind of take the entire industry to the masses as we learn how to actually effectively use the blockchain for things that it's good at. But maybe to yeah. double click on a couple of each of your points, one, I would say, primarily focused on training is interesting in the space. Uh, I've talked with a couple other teams that are trying to do either just the general purpose compute, um, such as Kosh or just focusing on inference. Um, and I would love to ultimately get into kind of the cost segment as well. And I think maybe this line of questioning will get us there, but in terms of kind of real world modeling and creating these very large systems, uh, typically it is my understanding that you have a large compute com com compute cluster of GPUs. Uh, typically those are bound by like NVLink, uh, like located in a specific like server farm in some part of the world. How, I guess, by accessing thousands or millions of decentralized GPUs and not having kind of that direct linking in between GPUs. How do you deal with some of those problems, um, even if they are asynchronous? Yeah, so it typically... Yeah, they, I think yeah, it typically comes down to the, the framework that you use to, to train the model. So, I mean, like the, the kind of... The kind of... Uh, when you get down to brass tacks, like the interlinks are obviously far slower so you have to do you know you have to do more training on a device and you have to basically to some extent you know manage the bandwidth if you're using depending on the internet connection you're using whereby you you know only only send parameter updates to some centralized mod, some centralized kind of you know version of the model which is being maintained by the whole network um that's like point one some um some protocols, so for example, BitTensor, they steer directly into locking it to only one framework. So they um, they do uh, decentralized mixtures of uh, experts, uh, which came out of the Yandex Research Labs. And that's like a good kind of example of, of, of this, but it's kind of, you know, their whole protocol is just kind of customized on that one, or at least currently just kind of customized on that one, one type of framework. We want to be framework agnostic, but with the knowledge that, you know, if you're building large models, which are typically going to be kind of, you know, multi-GPU, uh, as you said, like they typically have these huge clusters that are trained on, then we'll need frameworks which kind of operate over, you know, over those, over those devices. I don't know, Ben, if you want to touch on some of those frameworks. Yeah, I think the the crucial thing to think about is 
what Jensen does is change the base cost of like certain resources within the system. So you think about the simplest ones, you've got compute as a resource and you've got communication as a resource. And in a traditional cluster, you've got InfiniBand and a data center, you've got thousands of GPUs connected up. The kind of resource cost for the person using that is compute is relatively expensive. Communication is then relatively cheap because of the fast interconnects. So you build a system that uses those to their optimal degree. So you do a lot of communication because communication is cheap in like comparison to compute, uh, and you're kind of trying to use compute in the most efficient way. When you look at Jensen, what we're doing, if we once we build the network to its maximum size, you've brought down the cost of compute drastically. So compute is way, way, way cheaper. You can access it at a vastly decreased cost per whatever unit you want to call it a computer flop maybe machine learning you can call it other things uh, but essentially that base cost has gone down but the communication cost has gone up because of the interconnects are slower like harry described um, but you when you look at that from a distributed systems perspective we have a lot of kind of things that are disposable disposal to trade off compute for communication and that's all this process is it's looking at that and saying okay we've got a new environment now where the cost of compute has come down the cost of communication has gone up let's do like optimal scheduling over that um, and we can use use those resources to their best degree again. And that hasn't really been done very much. It's been done a little bit, like Harry mentioned, the Yandex Lab have done, done some of it. Stanford have got some great research uh, in it. And ultimately, when we look at that whole space, we think there's there's kind of two main paths forward. One of them is a short to medium term, and one of them is very long term. The short to medium term is treat it as an optimal scheduling problem. So weight the cost of those resources and then send uh, parts of the model to the compute that has fast interconnects where you need it to have fast interconnects, do more computation where it doesn't have fast interconnects, and generally kind of come to an overall optimal point when you're training over this like heterogeneous latency compute. So you can do that right now. There's, there's some good research that shows doing that over volunteer compute, essentially. Long term, like Harry said, we think there will be completely new models. So something like decentralized mixture of X experts, maybe even decentralized mixture of experts could be the way forward. The crucial thing is, as Harry said, we don't want to make a bet on that. We don't want to say we think this will be the right framework. What we want to say is whatever happens underneath this, you need compute and you need to do that trade off of communication and compute to build a network that covers the entire planet and beyond. Um, and the kind of key yeah. reason behind that is something we touched on earlier, where the scaling hypothesis still holds for machine learning models. The bigger you make them, the better they are. The space has progressed down, let's make bigger data centers because this is the way we build models right now. Let's add another 1,000 GPUs and we'll make a bigger model. That's getting more and more expensive. There's fewer places you can actually build a data center that can host enough GPUs. Our answer to that is, okay, stop this arms race. Stop trying to build ridiculously large data centers. Let's just connect everything up and use it. Then, yeah, we're going to have to use it in a slightly different way. But when we do, instead of adding another 1,000 GPUs to your model, you've just added millions, which just blows everything away way in theory yeah exactly it requires like a shift change in the way you think about training models but it kind of answers the natural conclusion of more like how do i get more like because you've got you know if you give someone a cluster it's kind of like i often think that like the gpus are like bones and if you look back at models it's like the fossil record it's like how big the dinosaur was how big the model was was based on the gpus like the bones you know so when it was like you know people were training on the v100s now they're on the a100s and you can kind of see the models getting bigger and bigger and the cluster is getting bigger but like event there's just human needs are kind of you know unsatisfiable it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and it's going to have to come out the data center you know there's stuff where people are even trying to optimize it within the data center so ben spoke about like the team at stanford there's good stuff out of ucla which takes stuff like g pipe and it turns into stuff like pipe dream the bamboo paper if anyone's interested in reading it kind of covers that um we're actively researching how to build you know these large very large decentralized networks and you know we'll probably have like various frameworks available on the jensen you know platform which, which are useful as ben said one of them might be uh decentralized mixture of experts but de there's definitely multiple other ways to do it um but it just does require a kind of shift in thinking so to speak 
I'd love to just add to that. Like, we would love to speak to anyone who's building these these frameworks. If we can tailor Jensen, because the the kind of one of the, I guess the the traps for building a network like ours is you have to make certain decisions when you're building this protocol, uh, and some of those decisions could cut off avenues of research, and we don't want to cut off any avenues. So basically, if anyone has any opinions on how to build uh, a decentralized model over enormous amounts of compute, we're very open to talk, collaborate, run experiments just so that as we're building Jensen, we enable that use case alongside enabling all the other use cases. Um, and you can you can think about like competition in our space and like you've mentioned, a few kind of players doing things. Ultimately, we think there's loads of opportunity here. People doing optimal models for the new infrastructures can sit on top of Jensen. We would absolutely love that to happen. Um, so we're open to collaborating with absolutely anyone who is kind of building these new types of models yeah. or new optimal scheduling or anything like that. Please come and talk to us, basically. Yeah, and you don't need you don't need to be a machine learning person. A lot of the best ideas come out of the distributed systems world, where these are problems that already exist, but like in in different kind of verticals. Um, but they're becoming obviously, given the topic of this discussion, exceptionally important for for machine learning. And maybe double clicking on bringing the cost down for decentralized GPU <laughs> compute is that really just accessing kind of idle like 3080s, um, 4080s that people have in their homes for gaming computers or now even laptops, as you mentioned, MacBook Pros uh, have rather rather beefy GPUs, PS4s, PS5s, those type of things that historically have just been local to kind of someone's home now get added to a network that can then be tapped in to start training models. Yeah, I think before before answering that, it, it kind of like a kind of walk through history kind of frames the discussion quite well. Like if you think about the other industrial revolutions, you know, if someone said, you know, back at the kind of you know turn of the twentieth century, if we made the electrical grid cheaper, like let's just say we reduced the price list of energy somehow, or in the late kind of twentieth century, if the US had leaned into nuclear power more, and you know, there's more power, there's more scale. Or if, you know, Andrew Carnegie and his associates had made like the Bessemer steel process like earlier and better, you know, things like that. And we just had more of, you know, these kind of like core resources. I mean, higher and they were cheaper and there was this higher scale of them. The world would be so far ahead given the kind of compounding returns you would get on, on those advancements. Um, so we really think that like getting the price as low as possible is, you know, as cheap as absolutely possible is, is, is the core of view here. And we do it by kind of three different ways. So the first is you disintermediate people charging rent. Um, you know, this has happened to like a large extent, you know, in the kind of Web2 world with um, companies like say, let's take like a quite vanilla example, like TransferWise. So TransferWise, international payments, you know, disintermediated banks to some extent, they, they kind of took, a, took away the kind of, or the intermediated banks, depending on how you look at it, they basically took away this kind of like huge fee structure, which was being charged on both sides by banks, and they made it much cheaper to send money internationally. And then, you know, in many cases, that's become even cheaper, you know, with, with crypto, where you can send even larger sums internationally. It's obviously permissionless as well. When we think about it, that's a good example of like, you know, the someone kind of stepping in, reducing the fees, taking it away from kind of oligopolis. Of course, now they're a kind of oligopolis and they can increase the fees. So it's, you know, whatever. We're building a system which kind of can't be turned into an evil thing. It's a crypto protocol. It doesn't charge a fee. All it has is peer to peer. And of course, the person on the other side of the transaction, you know, someone renting out a GPU, they can set the, they can choose the, the, the machine learning job. They can kind of have a, a price they'll accept, et cetera. But, you know, it'll be significantly cheaper than that price plus some enormous kind of gross margin charge on top. So that's kind of point one. Um, point two is accessing, as you kind of said, this sort of like long tail of like dormant and kind of underused or like unused compute increases the size of the pie significantly. Obviously, the more you go to that type of stuff, you then come in with even heavier kind of, you know, limitations with like the bandwidth issues, et cetera, with the, with the available memory on the, on the machine, you know, like if you've just got like a gaming PC, um, that, that can be problematic. But the idea is by increasing the size of the, 
you know the size of supply you create like an overall kind of like you know depression in, in the price of in the price of compute and the third and final example is our kind of like longer term vision is that instead of kind of there being kind of you know where's the compute going to be in the world it'll be highly decentralized but we think it will kind of go the way of bitcoin mining to some extent whereby you'll have these kind of you know I guess like mines set up, which are mining kind of machine learning models. Oh, the word mining is probably wrong here, but like just using it for simplicity, they're mining machine learning models. You know, they're sat over a geothermal vent in Iceland somewhere where they're getting ultra cheap electricity to do it. It's one hundred percent customized for you know the the structure just for training machine learning models just on the network in a permissionless way. And then these data centers will then encourage like downstream an industry of people building ultra specialized, you know, hardware just for trading in these protocols, which might look slightly different to the hardware today. So then you you kind of get this, it's kind of like the ASIC industry for, you know, Ant Miner and stuff like that for Bitcoin. Um I, I will say that like, you know, building machine learning chips is a pretty hard task and there's various companies uh, in, in the space, you know, who work in this area like Cerebras and Graphcore and stuff who've, who have made really super valiant efforts over the years. And so it's, it's, this fair point is like the way easier said than done, but you know, it, it's definitely long-term our, our thinking, more customized chips. This is one of the pieces today, because Logan, you mentioned like the uh, like the gaming PCs, and, and obviously, as Harry said, we expect this progression to be kind of very specialized, similar to the, how Bitcoin mining went, where yeah, there'll be a lot of optimization of where machine learning is done over the planet to be it be done in like nice places where renewable energy is and energy is cheap and things, and then it sort of proxies energy markets in a similar way to Bitcoin did. But there's another axis, which is. AI for individuals is ramping up incredibly quickly. Um, and what we expect to happen is almost a, a progression of when we kind of like back in the day when like Microsoft and, and various other people were saying there'll be a PC in every home. The future in our minds is there'll be a, a, a brain in every home. There'll be a essentially kind of AI system that is running that home. And each individual person is going to have personal kind of companion AI models that they interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that they ask questions to, that they kind of like learn quicker through all the ways that... I think at the moment, relatively like techni technologically literate people do with ChatGPT, but much, much wider. It's going to get integrated much more deeply into what we do. It won't be just a chat interface. It will be inside the UX of the apps that we use. But in order for that to happen, it's going to be driven into the home. And there will be device manufacturers who put a big kind of machine learning capable device in each home, like centered around um, like your kind of home chat device like a, a Siri or an Echo or something like that, or centered around your TV or your entertainment, but somewhere there's going to be this big device. That device is going to be expensive. To get that device into every home, um, it's going to cost those people, those homeowners, a lot of money. Jensen presents a way that we can optimize usage of all of those devices and essentially bring down and subsidize for the homeowner the cost of that device. Because when they're using it, they can be using it, but they could be using millions at the same time. So when their model's training, it could train over the local neighborhood and then when it's not training it can be being used by the local neighborhood so it becomes this like smoothing function over all of these devices and essentially makes them affordable to everyday people it's a little bit like how mobile phone contracts gave us all iphones like back when the iphone came out the idea of dropping like a grand on a phone was absolutely insane but yeah. getting a 30 pound a month contract not quite as insane so it's that kind of like way of getting it into the hands of people that actually gets it further out jensen can do that similarly to phone contracts but without you having a contract with this centralized entity instead you're just using a peer-to-peer -peer network to earn money when you're not using your device and then use other people's devices when you're not earning money so just to reiterate kind of the three top points, ultimately kind of disimmediating the current like monopoly of GPU oligarchs, uh, a little bit of tapping into kind of the home GPUs uh, in the future, the larger compute clusters that are going to be needed to power kind of our everyday devices as AI becomes more prevalent. And then the third is, again, tapping into larger compute clusters uh, that maybe have the NVLink or kind of idle GPUs or spe special purpose built for kind of these decentralized compute networks uh, that are long-term. And in some form or fashion, all of these three are kind of 
progressing simultaneously. And while yes. Jensen is kind of ramping up, that the network ultimately will be able to add more compute over time, allowing bigger models to be trained over time. Exactly. Yes, Jensen's exactly. agnostic. It, J- Jensen is designed to be really low level technology. So we, we think about it as like a sliver above the electricity itself, where all we want to do is network up all of this compute for this purpose. And that's it. So as much compute as we possibly can, we talk about it as anything that's machine learning capable should be able to run Jensen and be able to move bits of models around and do that training. We don't kind of decide it's it has to be these specific devices we want it just right at that lowest level which is why when it comes down to the kind of uh, the optimal way of using that network we're a little bit more sanguine about that because we like an ecosystem built on top of it that figures out loads of different ways of using this compute and we just sit underneath it like a, a protocol in the web one sense like tcp ip or http or something like it's a communication rails uh, and then on top of that if somebody thinks hey i can build a large language model using decentralized mixed of experts in a super optimal way over that network please do go ahead same for a computer vision model same for an audio any modality Uh, and we think there'll be a rich ecosystem of this stuff that other people can build we'll just be there kind of behind the scenes everyone will forget we exist but we'll be kind of like the rails underneath everything yeah maybe i just i'd add I'd, I'd, i'd add one more one more thing which is just a lot of people um they kind of view the world through um, through the current centralized paradigm of like you know everyone runs everything in the cloud, but you know in the, like the early two thousands and you know the nineties and stuff, the idea of running stuff in the cloud was like heretical. You know, it was like it was on prem, and you know the success of the the cloud giants today and you know other providers who are adjacent to them is really you know kind of by virtue of them managing to pull all this stuff out, you know, out of the edge and into like a centralized place, but there was huge resistance. So we see this as kind of like a natural kind of evolution again, where it was originally kind of, you know, decentralized and they got centralized. Now it's going to get decentralized again, but probably be a push to make it more centralized. You know, like it just, it kind of comes and goes and there's a certain degree of like, myopic thinking, I think, for, for, from some people in, in the space when they kind of, like, we, we've heard it all, right? You know, we have, like, a public light paper, and, you know, you hear all you hear all the kind of critiques on it, and it's interesting kind of framing it, you know, relative to the kind of Web 1 world where things were very much decentralized, and there were a large number of people whose livelihoods actually depended on things not moving to the cloud, so. Maybe last question, just kind of on the technical architecture, and then I do want to move forward to the verification problem that we've kind of highlighted in the beginning in terms of, I think not investor standpoint or, but some of the biggest critiques when I talk with various people in the industry is that that compute offset of cheaper compute cannot be, will not get to the point where it's cheap enough to offset bandwidth costs, or maybe even those bandwidth costs, just cause higher training times. Can you maybe address those concerns of people that either think bandwidth is going to be too expensive versus the compute or think that training these models in a more decentralized way is just going to be much harder than kind of doing a large server farm? I think um, there's some of this is Like collectively, I think when it comes to machine learning, we have a weirdly short memory. And when you actually like look back over the progression of machine learning, these centralized clusters of like multiple GPUs all with super fast interconnects haven't really been around for very long. Like it's only been a few years as we've kind of progressed on this path to say, this is the best way of doing things. And then if you kind of like, dive back into the history of like, and I say history, it's literally a few years, but like, why, why did we go down this path? And then you you think, well, we went down this path because the research teams at large organizations thought, hey, we can make the models bigger if we like put some GPUs together. So they did. And then they had a load of GPUs that were together. So they thought, 
what if we build a better model over these GPUs? And then they did that. And then they thought, well, what if we add more GPUs? And then essentially, if you look at the entire space of how we could have progressed in machine learning research, we took like one path through that space. And that path was driven by research organizations that had the resources to put together a cluster to initially kind of show, hey, making it bigger makes it better. And then they made did research for those clusters. And it really siloed the develop, development of machine learning down that one path. But there's lots of paths within a research problem where you go down them a little bit and then you pull back a bit and then you go down a different path and go way further. And that's what we think is happening here. We've gone down this path of centralized clusters being effective and we're, start, we're slowing and slowing the progress just because it's much harder to create a, a bigger kind of cluster now. Maybe it's time that we just walk back that path a little bit, do a different path, which is let's connect up all the devices and just like build over that. And then we explore that. And we're very, very bullish on that path, uh, particularly because of the point of when you're in a, you can kind of see research as like any search problem. You have exploration phases and you have exploitation phases. Exploration is where essentially in like a big evolutionary kind of search, you would have loads of different like things zooming all over the place, trying to map the whole space. Once you've found an area that's compelling, you zoom into that area, you need fewer doing much more deliberate steps. We think machine learning is still in an exploration phase. We should have as many people as possible building as many different weird and wonderful ways of doing this as possible. And the way to do that is to give out access to a resource like this to m way more people, rather than continuing down this siloed path where very, very few people can build models for those centralized infrastructures, which means that we're just not exploring as much as we could. We're, we're in exploitation when we should be in exploration. So pulling back, going a different path, incredibly compelling to us. And ultimately kind of making the whole AI ecosystem more open source in that project. Uh, I, I think uh, it was Peter Thiel that said, ultimately something to the fact is AI is kind of like centralizing and crypto is decentralizing. Um, but really what you're trying to do here is have the best of both worlds where you can really give access to that decentralized compute to the many instead of the few. Yeah, there's a there's a core kind of final point here, I'd say, which is maybe a bit like philosophical, but, you know, throughout human history, we've been very, like most people over, you know, in most kind of recent like civilizations have been pretty comfortable with the idea that the biological neurons in your head kind of belong to you and your thoughts belong to you. And that, you know, your, your ability to like, you know, reason about things should really be, you know, in, in between your ears, like it's, 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 it's all you, obviously there's lots of sensory inputs from all over the place, you know, and lots of people trying to bias you and convince you to do other things. Sure. But it's all you inside. We've entered this weird kind of like, kind of slightly transhuman world just now where we're getting very close, literally close, you know, with brain machine interfaces to extending our minds with artificial neurons. In a sense, we already do it. Things like autocomplete on the phone, you know, it's sort of, it's kind of there, but not directly, not in the like, you know, Blade Runner sense, but the, but we're, we will get there really soon. And there's a question everyone has to ask themselves, which is who do you want to own the artificial neurons, which are going to fuse with your biological neurons? Cause it's going to happen. And we're going to have, you know, brain machine interfaces, which process signals from our brain and make decisions based on it. And someone might control the weights in those neurons. Um, right now there's various regulators around the world who are pushing for either them to have ultimate say over what can go on those models, which is a absolute nightmare. That's, you know, just the amount of control that would provide them the amount of, you know, the amount of misuse which is capable there is, is, is awful. But then secondly, we have a second strand of, you know, kind of AI oligopolists who also want to control it. And, you know, we go back to that point about bias right at the beginning. Bias, you know, it's up to you to determine your own biases. You know, you don't want someone else to determine them for you. You have to like, think critically. But, you know, if you can ask ChatGPT a question about something which someone in Silicon Valley deems, you know, politically incorrect, you're losing your ability to reason. And okay, whilst that's outside of your head, it's like maybe it doesn't maybe it doesn't matter so much. But if you're gonna fuse it with your with your mind in some way, in a more direct way, suddenly you really do have the you know reason to care about it. And right now the battle for open source 
is the first battle on a long path to ensuring that that is, you know, that world isn't going to go the dystopian way that, you know, we painted previously there. Um, and that starts with things like the EU AI Act, various things going through Congress just now. Um, the litany of AI doomerism around, you know, the world's going to, you know, <laughs> Armageddon and all this type of stuff that's going to come from allowing open source models, which is just so patently false. Um, yeah, it's just a point, a philosophical point worth thinking about. Slightly long-term point, but worth No, it's, a, it's very beautiful. I think you don't really even have to squint too much to see the things that Elon's doing with Neuralink, Neuralink um, and how AI is going to be more evolved in our daily lives. And you really want either that compute that's running those neural networks to be decentralized or local. Uh, you definitely don't want it to be on someone else's server where they're kind of controlling, especially in the Neuralink syncs, uh, mm. your individual thoughts. Yeah, it, I think when we think about it, it's like, it's the like Harry mentioned that kind of general human progression of just making our minds more effective, and you can trace it like all the way back to like writing, right? Like writing allowed us to offload memory, so like you don't have to keep everything in your head anymore. You can write it down, uh, and the sort of conversation we're having right now is: do we write it down on a piece of paper we have, or do we write it down on a piece of paper that's owned by like one company in the world, <laughs> and they go and put that in a big warehouse somewhere and read it like whenever they want? Yeah. Like that would be absolutely insane. Um, with a pen, it's the same thing. Yeah. With, a pen, <laughs> with, a pen, with a pen that sometimes turns off if you're writing a bad, a bad word or like you know. <laughs> exactly it, it, it's 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 crazy when you think about that and it's like it's this continual progression of we've made it more and more efficient so instead of writing we now have like conversation with chat gbt which is just so much more efficient than us writing something down and like harry mentioned and you mentioned logan like in the future we'll have brain computer interfaces which are even more efficient we'll be putting more information in it when basically making our own diary that become an extended memory of our brains and then we're having the choice now like we said of do we just hand them to this like one person or do we own them ourselves and i think crucially on the pen point we're benefiting as humanity in progress pro like collective progression of this stuff like we wouldn't want everyone to build their own pen and only use that we would want to sort of collectively like design pens together and then be able to use the different pens that other people have designed because then we're using the best pen that's to our mind why we need open source ai because then we're all inputting into the pens that we use if i pick a pen and use it i know that it could have been audited by anybody in the world i know an academic somewhere can look at that pen and can say hey something really weird going on inside that pen maybe you shouldn't use it rather than it being just this like completely foreign object to me that i just write with and like harry said every so often like the words don't actually come out and the ink stops and then maybe it writes something that i didn't write and i don't realize and yeah all, all this kind of weird stuff we've got this open auditor where somebody can tell me if that's happening and I can pick a different pen. <laughs> yeah, it is. I feel like we could talk for hours and this kind of opened up a new can of worms that uh, I haven't put too much thought into, but you you can de definitely see that future. Um, just in the sense of time, I do want to kind of like in the final like five minutes, double click on the verification problem that each of you kind of mentioned and highlighted as the core bottleneck to actually scaling these decentralized compute systems, um, verifying that the model has run and run correctly. Can you touch upon that? Sure. So the verification problem kind of comes from two places. Um, firstly, what are, we, what are we trying to verify? Basically, you train a machine learning model. The output of a machine learning model being trained is basically a bunch of tensors, which are which basically a bunch of arrays which have values, and those values, when you know used in the network architecture, produce more favorable outcomes than than a random set of of, of kind of, of values. So that's what you want. That's the prize, um, and that's what's. When we say like open sourcing models, typically we talk about open sourcing the whites, the better whites. So the idea then is, okay, how do you confirm that the weights that you ended up with are a reasonable conclusion from the training process? So a very like trivial way to do that would just be for two people to run the training process where one of them's trusted and then it says, yeah, okay, this is the same result, you know, whatever. But if one of them's trusted, then you don't need the other person. So immediately like, the idea of decentralizing it requires, you know, you don't want to have 100% replication. You don't want to have someone just 
or you don't have anyone centralized who's kind of given this kind of arbitrary authority over anyone else. So you solve this by, you know, getting around two issues. The first issue is when the model is being trained, firstly, it's state dependent, which means as the training process proceeds, it requires the previous, you know, like section of the training process to update. So models update their parameters kind of cyclically. You need the previous parameters as the starting point to give the next parameters. And that makes it quite difficult when compared to stuff like rendering, whereby if you have an image, you can imagine you can just pick like a, and someone renders an image, you could just render a tiny bit of the image yourself, take that tiny bit from their rendering, compare it and say, okay, it's the same. I'm going to trust that the rest of it's the same, given that they didn't know which part I was going to audit. Um, and then you can make that game theoretically secure. That quality of the, the image being kind of, you know, splittable into those different chunks is called something being embarrassingly parallel. That isn't the case for training machine learning models. That's the first point. Second point is even if you overcome the embarrassingly parallel problem, you still have to actually redo part of the work. And one of the biggest kind of advantages of machine learning in the kind of 2010s was a lot of the hardware acceleration which happened on the GPUs. So basically making models um, train faster by doing essentially like for NVIDIA, like you know, CUDA um, operations faster, basically doing matrix multiplications faster, finding better ways to do it. That's come at the cost of determinism in many cases. So basically the idea that if you put the same inputs for the same model on the same device, it might result in different outputs, which in the context of a decentralized network where you're sending around hashes of things is awful because it means that if there's a bit, one bit out of place somewhere, you're screwed because the entire hash is different and you can't compare them. Um, we solve that by fixing number one, the reproducibility problem. So we rewrite certain kernels on GPUs, compilers. We also work to basically change at various levels, like the framework level and the system level, various parameters on the nodes which are running our software such that the results are bitwise reproducible, both on the same device and between devices. Um, obviously, it's a bit like as you add in more exotic devices, it becomes a bit harder, but certainly there's a lot of Pareto kind of laws with respect to the devices which are being used. So we fix the, the reproducibility problem. And then we use a, a kind of customized checkpointing and replication schedule in addition to a, um, a, pr a proof scheme, a polynomial interactive proof scheme to basically check the work in a way which is optimal given the bandwidth constraints such that you can chunk the work up into slightly smaller sections, not totally atomic sections, but smaller sections. And then those sections can then be tested by a third party. And then the kind of result of those two um, parties doing the computation can then be rolled up on chain and checked by the chain. And with that, you get a game theoretically secure verification process for the Nash equilibrium as nobody cheats. It's very complicated. Uh, obviously it touches on like lots of different areas from distributed systems to, you know, um, cryptography to GPU hardware kind of, uh, but yeah, I don't know, Ben, if you would, if you would add anything to that. I, I'd probably just add one thing, which is like, when you when we kind of describe that it is complicated a lot of the complexity comes down to just having a kind of real world uh, perspective and saying whatever happens this has to be efficient so there are kind of theoretical ways that you can solve this which in a perfect world would be the kind of ultimate like solution to this problem but in reality when you actually try and implement them would just be horrendously inefficient over all of these devices the goal of jensen is to be kind of pragmatic whilst also actually solving the problem so that's why we kind of have that combination of like the game theoretic aspects with the probabilistic aspects with the cryptographic aspects where if you were going for the kind of like soundest system the most secure system you might go down a pure cryptography route but you'd have a system that once you actually get it out into the real world would never actually be usable because it would be ludicrously expensive uh, and it would be ludicrously slow uh, and over time what we expect to happen is as technology progresses you can change those trade-offs so you can you make it really efficient in the beginning and it, it's it's kind of using the technology as it stands right now but then as cryptography progresses maybe we trade off some of the probabilistic aspects for more cryptographic aspects the system gets more secure and overall it kind of it gets sounder over time uh, but it is a progression it's not something that you build once and then it's kind of done forever it's this thing that will grow and expand as we kind of explore the space of cryptographic techniques and encryption and all of these new things that we can do um, but ultimately like i said for us, it's pragmatism. It's making something that actually solves a problem in the real world, and then we can build on top of it, and we can refine it, and we can make it more efficient and kind of uh, better over over time. My new uh, 
kind of favorite phrase that I've been saying to builders is ruthless pragmatism, uh, because I think that is really what crypto needs for mass adoption. Um, but Ben, uh, Harry, I feel like we could talk for hours, but I, I want to be uh, aware of your time. So really, truly appreciate you coming on the podcast. I feel like we touched upon a lot from kind of the open sourceness, even the hardest problem of verification to how these actually networks actually work under the hood from getting larger compute clusters online to the home uh, compute to disintermediating kind of the middlemen that exist today through walking through all the technical problems to being able to ultimately build these models um, and run them locally or either on a decentralized cluster when kind of the neural links of the world ultimately enter our minds. Um, it was a really fascinating conversation. And again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having us. Really enjoyed it.